Inside our body, we have these specialized cells known as adipose cells that function to basically store fatty acids in their triglyceride form. So if we look within the cytoplasm of these adipose cells, we'll find these large structures known as fat globules. And these fat globules consist entirely of individual triglyceride molecules. Now, we know the cells of our body can actually use these triglyceride molecules to help generate ATP molecules, but how exactly does this process actually take place? So, as we'll see in just a moment, the utilization of these triglycerides to actually help us generate these high energy ATP molecules involves three different steps, three different stages. So in stage one, these triglycerides are actually broken down and mobilized into their fatty acid and glycerol form. Once that takes place, the fatty acids are released into the bloodstream and the bloodstream carries these molecules, the fatty acids, to their target cell. Once the fatty acid makes its way into the cytoplasm of that target cell, that's when stage B actually takes place. And in stage B, these fatty acids are activated, they're made more reactive, and then they're transported into the matrix of the mitochondria. And that's when stage C begins. In stage C, those fatty acids are broken down in the matrix of the mitochondria into acetyl coenzyme A molecules. And these acetyl coenzyme A molecules can be fed into the citric acid cycle to help us generate the high energy ATP molecules. Now, in this lecture, what I'd like to focus on is, is stage A. So the breakdown and the mobilization of these triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol molecule, molecules, and this takes place within these adipose cells, fat cells of our body. So let's suppose that we just woke up and after waking up, we basically wanna go for a run or a swim. So we want to carry out some type of exercise. Now, overnight what happened was, the cells of our body used up their supply of glucose and glycogen. And so as soon as we go for that morning run or swim, our cells will depend on triglycerides to actually form the, uh, uh, the ATP molecules that are needed to carry out those particular cell processes. And so the question is, what actually initiates the breakdown and the mobilization of triglycerides within our fat cell in this circumstance? Well, basically specific types of hormones. So we have hormones such as glucagon and epinephrine that can initiate the breakdown and the mobilization of triglycerides. So we have some type of primary messenger molecule, so it can be glucagon or it can be epinephrine that binds onto a specific 7 transmembrane protein receptor found on the membrane of adipose cells. And once it actually binds, it creates a conformational change in that 7TM structure and that causes structural changes in the G protein. And what that does is it releases the GDP and it basically accepts the GTP. And once the GTP binds onto that G protein and activates the protein, and the protein then travels and binds onto another membrane molecule known as adenylate cyclase. And what this enzyme basically does is, upon the binding, it is activated. Upon the binding of the G protein, it is activated, and it begins the conversion of ATP molecules into cyclic AMP molecules. And the cyclic AMP is a secondary messenger in this particular signal transduction pathway. Now the cyclic AMP molecules then move on to target protein, so PKA molecules, protein kinase A. So cyclic AMP binds onto the regulatory units of the PKA that causes the dissociation of the catalytic units from the PKA and that activates the PKA. And once the PKA is actually activated, protein kinase A goes on to phosphorylate and activate two important types of enzymes involved in the breakdown and the mobilization of triglycerides. So what are these important enzymes? Well, one of them is known as paralipin A, and the other set of enzymes are known as hormone-sensitive lipases. So these two enzymes work together to basically help break down these triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol molecules.
More specifically, the paralipinae basically binds onto the fat globules found in the cytoplasm of adipose cells, and they stimulate the remodeling and the restructuring of these fat globules. What that does is it exposes the ester bonds of the triglycerides, and now the hormone sensitive lipases, such as triglyceride lipase, essentially bind onto those exposed ester bonds and begin cleaving breaking, hydrolyzing those triglyceride ester bonds. And so ultimately, we transform the triglycerides into the individual free-floating fatty acids and the glycerol molecules. And once that takes place, these two molecules in their mobilized form are now released into the bloodstream. Now, once inside the bloodstream, what happens next? Well, glycerol molecules contain one to three hydroxyl groups, and that makes them polar molecules. And because our blood plasma consists predominantly of water, that means glycerol will be soluble in the blood plasma, and so it will not actually require any type of protein carrier to transport it within the blood plasma. Now, glycerol molecules ultimately end up in liver cells, and we'll discuss exactly what happens to the glycerol molecules in just a moment. But first, let's actually look at these fatty acids. Now, fatty acids contain this relatively long hydrocarbon chain, the R group, and that makes fatty acids insoluble in water, and so they will not be able to actually dissolve in our blood plasma. And unlike glycerol molecules, fatty acids will require a protein transporter molecule. And this molecule is known as serum albumin. So serum albumin actually binds fatty acids in the blood plasma and it carries those fatty acids to the target cell. And in the example that I gave before, the target cell that the fatty acids are carried to are the skeletal muscle cells that help us carry out the different types of voluntary motion, voluntary motions. Now, what happens to the glycerol? Well, the glycerol, as I said earlier, moves into liver cells. And once inside the cytoplasm of liver cells, an enzyme known as glycerol kinase traps that glycerol inside that liver cell and it traps it by giving it a negative charge. So it actually takes off a phosphoryl group from an ATP, places it onto the oxygen of glycerol, forms an ADP as well as the L-isomer of glycerol 3-phosphate and this traps the glycerol inside that particular liver cell. Now, what happens next is that glycerol 3-phosphate is transformed into dihydroxyacetone phosphate by the enzyme glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase. And it also actually reduces the NAD plus and generates NADH. So this is essentially an oxidation reaction where the glycerol 3-phosphate is oxidized into the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And once we form this, it is then transformed into the D isomer of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And recall that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is an intermediate of both the glycolytic pathway glycolysis as well as gluconeogenesis. Now, the fate of this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate basically depends on the conditions of the body and the liver cell. So essentially, if we need to generate ATP molecules within a liver cell, then the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can basically undergo glycolysis. We can form pyruvate, and that can help us generate ATP molecules. On the other hand, if the liver cells have to maintain, let's say, increase the blood glucose levels in our body, then the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can undergo gluconeogenesis and form the glucose molecule, and the glucose can be released least into the blood plasma of our body to help regulate and maintain the proper glucose levels of the body. So we see that the glycer we see that the glycerol that is formed from the breakdown of the triglycerides ultimately ends up in the liver cell and it can be used by the liver cell to basically help, uh, help maintain the correct blood glucose levels and also help generate uh, ATP molecules needed by that liver cell. Now, what happens to the fatty acids? Well, this is what I'd like to focus on in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss how these fatty acids are activated within the target cell and then transported into the matrix of the mitochondria of that target cell.